Hello, this is Dr. Lisa Belisle, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. And today is a very special day because we've opened up our studio. We are now back in person uh, talking with an actual live human across the table from me. This is happens to be my neighbor, but also many other things in his own right. This is Josh Lowe. Thank you for coming in and talking to me today. Thanks for having me. So Josh, it wasn't just because you're my neighbor and you're fully vaccinated and you happen to live right up the hill from me that we brought you in. You also have quite an interesting background, not only as an architect, but also in art. Yeah, I, uh, I grew up kind of immersed in art. My mom was the local art league teacher and we kind of sat in those classes as she was teaching in the summer. And then when we got old enough, she was she moved on into the public schools and became kind of the head of the art department as we were kind of heading out into going to college and, and all that. Me and my sisters kind of all ended up in art-related disciplines. And where do you fall in the lineup of children, oldest, youngest? I'm the middle, so I have an older sister who's a metalsmith, uh, Heidi, and then my younger sister is an oil painter, and she's about six years younger than me. Oh, middle child. So interesting. So that must have been kind of fun to see where your older sister went before you and then the choices that your younger sister made after you. Yeah, she, well, Heidi, my older sister, um, kind of paved the way. Like in high school, she had already asked the art teachers to let her do jewelry. So like when I got there, I was able to make knives and um necklaces and rings and it was kind of already set because she was great at what she she does and now she she went to mecca so she went to the main college of art for uh, metal smithing and um now she has a studio and yeah so having her ahead of me kind of plowed the the way for me to be able to explore a lot of art related things and the teachers kind of just l let us have it you know let us do whatever and we had great teachers at that at that time that you know, we could, uh, one time I won a competition to do like a big totem pole for one of the, uh, big buildings in, in Wilmington. They had a competition and I submitted, you know, something this tall by this wide. And I said, oh yeah, if, if I win, I'll make it 15 feet by three feet wide. And I didn't know that I was going to win. And I hadn't really decided on what that was like. That was just like a, an estimate. And then they're like, okay, you win. And I was, tasked with figuring out what what it was going to be, how to get it in and out of the building. So we ended up having to tarp off an area of pretty much the size of the studio to build that sculpture that um, ended up going into a big building in Wilmington. So. so what was your totem pole constructed of? Uh, I chose something called biofoam. It was like this, it was kind of like surfboard material. Growing up, I did a a lot of surfing so it was kind of like surfboard foam and uh but it was not the beautiful white color it was kind of greenish and um we bought chainsaws and started like i i i was allowed to have like two apprentices once we got the commission or the the competition so then we were just hacking away early on with a chainsaw and then files and then after that like sandpaper and stuff so it was a lot like shaping a surfboard but it was we did um, like uh, different animals and um, a Native American head. So it was all the, like the original inhabitants of Delaware. That was kind of the idea. But it wasn't stacked like a true totem pole. It was kind of all kind of spiraling around this, this kind of tall mast. There aren't that many people I could think of who, when somebody said, oh, we, we'd like you to be in a totem pole creating competition, <laughs> would actually be interested in taking on that challenge. So how, what, what was it that caused you to think, oh, that's kind of cool. I'd like to do that. Well, it was just a sculpture competition. And I think five teams ended up winning five schools. And some people, when we went to uh, the, like the show, when they had installed all the pieces, we got to see all the other ideas and they were completely different. Like, you know, one of them was a bunch of uh, fish that were cut out of metal that were kind of curved and 
That was one I remember. I, I, I'm kind of forgetting some of the others. But yeah, it was that none of them were alike. I mean, you could tell that there wasn't kind of an idea of exactly what it was. They just created uh, five places where these things could be placed and, and, and let the kids have at it. And it was it was really fun. It was really exciting. And it was kind of the beginning for me of making things that were scaled, you know, big. And it was it was enjoyable in that way. You have a connection to one of the Portland Art Gallery artists, Steve Rogers, who I believe was not too far away from where your grandfather lived. Yeah, yeah. It was my grandfather grew up in Lewis and so did my dad, and which was one town from where I grew up. And uh, he is this amazing artist who makes these boats that I... As a kid, I was infatuated with because they were really well made. And uh, since my mom was kind of in the art community, I think he let me, you know, kind of help out. Like I remember putting sticks in water to get them ready for him to bend on these boat sculptures. And um, I was lucky that he kind of let me in on the studio. And I, I don't know how many sessions we did. It was a long time ago, but it was a... Uh, it was a, I was really thankful for that experience because it was like someone who was actually doing art or architecture in, in the world, you know, it's like not just a teacher, but someone who's, who's their, it's their job to make these, uh, beautiful pieces of artwork. So, um, yeah, he was, he was a, I'm thankful that he took me on. I was probably in middle school or early high school. So I, I don't know how much help I was to him, but his work is pretty amazing. And when I was with him, he was doing mainly sculptures, but he's moved on to doing a lot of these beautiful paintings too. Yes, we have one of his paintings behind us in the studio with a gorgeous boat and some high seas, a little bit of cloudiness, but with the sun peeking through. Uh, you're, you've had this experience also with the ocean. You have that connection. I mean, we obviously live near one another on Little John Island, but your connection with the ocean began far before you came here. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the ocean is like the ultimate teacher. You know, it, you you can kind of learn most things from from the water. And growing up, my dad was a lifeguard, you know, kind of ahead of when, when he had us. And so we were sailing as kids and at the beach, you know, often. And if you ever want to find any of my family members, all you'd have to do is about three, between three and five o'clock, there was a certain beach in row with him. My mom or sisters, you know, we were all kind of doing seasonal jobs in high school, but you could always find at least two of them there. You know, you just show up at the beach and that's where everyone kind of connected, even if we all had things going on in our lives in the summer that were pretty hectic. So it was, uh, I feel like it was pretty idyllic. As, as I've gotten older, I've realized how fun and amazing it is to be by the ocean. And I think that's a lot of why I was drawn back to the East Coast and also back to, to Maine, because I feel like we're pretty fortunate to be this close to the water. I mean, we're roughly like 200 feet away and we can see it every day. And I think it, I think it has a huge impact on just kind of the, the cycles of the day and kind of reminding you that we're not just just humans, you know, we're humans in a, in a landscape and in kind of the, in the world. So I love, I love the ocean and surfing has kind of been something that has pushed me to travel a bunch and to go all over the world to, to look for waves. And, and I feel like, you know, from that, you know, the tide, you know, kind of what's happening. And you're also kind of, you know, like over Christmas, we were all celebrating Christmas and my brother-in-law and I, who are, were both surfers, we were like kind of on the side watching, <laughs> watching what was happening with the waves because the next day it was just amazing. And we ended up just kind of disappearing and going for a, an adventure and finding some great waves, you know, in, in Maine and then kind of coming back into Christmas. But it was kind of a nice way to feel like, you know, it's not just about the human experience. It's about us in, in the world and, you know, in the ocean. Maine does have some very nice waves, as you said, but it may not be quite as easy to actually get to the waves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in Delaware, the beach is right there and kind of you just fall right into it. And um, in Maine, it's it's tricky. You've got to work and you got to work hard. And some of the surfers from here who have you know put their time in have 
you know, they're, they're taking boats, you know, they're, you know, getting on bikes, they're parking one place, they're biking to another place. And then they're, they're, you know, paddling across, uh, inlets and things like that just to get surf. And it, it can be in, you know, five degrees below, you know, so it's, it's, I've actually been blown away now that I'm a little bit older about how much risk it is, you know, cause you're kind of like, well, at this point I'm 45 minutes from anyone's help. And if the tide goes in or comes in, which it's going to do, it's even longer because maybe you're kind of out on a point that kind of fills in as the tide comes in. So yeah, it's, uh, it's tricky. It's, it's a lot of hard work, but when you do find a wave and you get good surf, it's like, it, it really, I don't know, it fills your cup up. You get really stoked about that experience and it, it makes it even better that you've kind of gone through all these steps to, to make it happen because it's, uh, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's a, it's a workout. <laughs> and it's also, you told me that it's better in the winter time. Yeah. Typically the summer is kind of the slow season for surf. So, you know, there's not as many storms. It's kind of stagnant. I mean, there are some storms and as you get into the hurricane season, there can be some good waves. Um, but consistently it's better in the winter. So usually when it's snowing, I'm checking the reports, seeing where to go, you know, where it might be, where it might be good. So that's kind of the, the trick of it is that, yeah, when it's the coldest and it's the hardest to get around, it's usually the best surf. So, uh, good wetsuits are, are important (laughs) and they've gotten better. So luckily you're, you're not freezing as much anymore as, as we were as high school kids surfing in the winter. How do you balance this love of the outdoors with the very much kind of inside work that you do as an architect? Well, uh, I would say it isn't easy. Um, and you have to really push yourself to get outside and kind of give yourself permission, which I'm not always so great at because I always see that next deadline in architecture. But, um, I find that, uh, when I do get out, I'm actually better at doing my work. So I try to give myself permission to, to go and surf and then step back in the studio. Cause then I'm way better at what I'm doing and, and I'm way less stressed about it. You know, it just kind of calms you to, if you've had a good surf in the morning or even within, you know, the last three days, I find that, uh, I'm much better at my, my job. So running my own business, I've kind of my business partner and I, we've, we've kind of made that a, a rule is get out, do the fun stuff of mountain biking or, or surfing or paddle boarding, just go and do something and come back and get to work. Don't, don't sit there and hope and wish and dream. And, um, my wife likes to say that I need to get my gills wet every once in a while. <laughs> and, uh, I think I'm a much better husband and dad, uh, when I'm, when I've surfed. So I, I, and, and, you know, architect. So I, I find that it's, I, or that's my excuse for continuing to surf. <laughs> so that's, uh, I, I feel like the generation before us was like, you know, all their kind of sports and things like that seemed to die away once they had kids. And I don't think that was a benefit for, for anyone. So I think for, for me, I've tried to keep it a part of my life and, it's, it hasn't always worked out, but I, I try my best to keep that balance. And I feel like you do a lot of running as well. So I think I've, I've been inspired by you guys as well. You, I see you guys out there doing your, we always notice your, you running across the bridge and we're like, she's, she's at it again. It can be raining and cold, but you're, you're still out there. So it's pretty inspiring. Well, when I talk to people who tell me that they had their running workout and they were on their treadmill for, you know, an hour, I think, you know, good for you. And I never could do that. I I would, I'm like you, I would rather be outside and know, um, what's going on with the weather. And some days it's not fun exactly, you know, but you do, you kind of maintain this connection with, if it's raining, you feel rain. If it's cold, you feel snow. And I don't think you can quite get that on a treadmill. Yeah, I agree. I, I've, uh, I grew up playing lacrosse in high school and, and there was a lot of guys that trained inside and I just, once I stopped playing sports and 
once I got out of college, I stopped playing, you know, like collegiate sports. And I was just like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm done doing the indoor training thing. Cause it's, for me, it's, it's not, it's still work. And, you know, I, you know, this is supposed to be the fun things we do that are kind of additional to our lives. So I always try to do it outside if I can, because yeah, doing architecture, I spend most of my time indoors. So you've taken a very practical approach to your architecture. You first were doing a lot of work with construction and building before you even started your training. Do you think that that caused you to look at architecture in a different way? Um, I would say that uh, construction kind of was a part of uh, my experience growing up as my dad was a contractor. So um, I've always had kind of an innate desire to be hands on and, you know, carving or working. And I, I took a furniture making class up in um, in Rockport uh, at the Center for Craftsmanship. And um, I just like making, you know, creating things. And so for me, I think the experience of creating is kind of part of architecture. And I try to be as close to that as possible. And um, sometimes I think it doesn't help. I think it holds you back sometimes because you're always searching for the practical way to make something, create something. And sometimes those, those practicalities kind of hold you back from what it is you're hoping to design in the end. But when you get engaged with the contractor and you start working, they're very thankful for those moments where you're fighting to make that design idea into something that's real because, so it helps there, but sometimes in the early stages, um, it can slow you down because it's, you're already thinking about the means and methods of how it goes together and Sometimes I have to pull back and just say, well, what, what would I really want if none of that was there? Because that's what architecture is, right? That's what design is. It's, we can easily make a house again. It's about trying to find a way of creating a building that fits the, the current person and the current unique parts of who that, who the occupants will be. You know, if it's a house, it's, you want to answer the question originally for that person and for the time and if you're held back by either the construction or kind of recreating something again you're not answering that question for the first time you're you're kind of just doing a repeat and i think that that's kind of the exciting part about architecture is that you've found an answer that fits the people that are there the occupants and also fits the moment in time you know, it's not just something that's a recreation. So it sounds like an interesting balance between uh, kind of planning and flow, between this idea that, you know, you do want to have all the steps laid out so that you can get to the product that you want, but you also have to have enough freedom and flexibility of mind so that you can allow things to kind of assemble themselves in a way that maybe be... I guess we call it in medicine, we call it supratentorial. Like it, it's kind of like it's, it's, there needs to be some kind of putting together of pieces that somehow you're not always entirely sure how it works, but it, it eventually does. Yeah. Um, in architecture, we kind of have a, a couple set moments that are a part of the process. You have um, concept design. Well, even before that, you have programming. So what is the problem? Kind of determining what the, the, the problem is. It sounds like a bad word, but for us, it's kind of setting the rules of the game. And then in concept design, you're kind of big picture, like what is this project about? You know, it's kind of the elevator pitch of the project. And then schematic design, you're kind of starting to fit the puzzle pieces together and see how they relate. And at that point, you've got the object usually you've got the parts it's got you know it's got a bathroom it's got a kitchen or you know offices and they're kind of starting to nest into each other and i think usually we've presented like a three-dimensional exterior if it's an exterior project and you know a walkthrough of the interior so the people usually know what it's looking like and are, have kind of signed off on that and then 
design development's kind of what is it made of you know what are the what is between the two rooms you know it's not just this you know gray lines you know it's not just two lines it's it's something you know what is it is it is it stone is it stucco is it wood that kind of thing so um architecture does have kind of a process of working towards that um that is helpful when you know you it gives you it starts to allow you for that freedom in each in each place so if you complete the steps i think it's it, it really helps outline kind of where you're at and keeps everyone kind of on task because it's really easy to jump back into another stage but i've learned from practice that it, it it's not good you gotta you gotta work through it and and kind of own the process as well what is your so you started in delaware then you hopped out to the west coast and then you came back a couple two and a half years ago what was the draw to california how did you end up out there well, um, when I graduated, I went to Roger Williams University in Rhode Island, and um, it was a great experience. You know, I, I was near the water again, and it was, I uh, got to travel abroad a bunch and kind of see, kind of live in Rome and live in, in different cities. And um, when I got done school, I went back to Delaware to kind of chip away at some of my debt, some of the, the school expenses. And and just kind of see, just do some construction because that's what I had done on the summer. So I, I, I was doing construction and I started doing a, I did a design build project for my mom. So I built my mom's house and redid that. And in that experience, I kind of realized I know how to design in the way that we've been taught in school and I know how to build, but I'm still figuring out how to make a living doing design. And if I jumped off on my own at that point, I realized I would just be recreating houses that I knew how to build because I hadn't really developed those. Th there was two silos and I hadn't really figured out how to get from one to the other. And so I thought big city is going to be, you know, the quickest way to get that done. You know, a lot of, a lot of architecture offices and San Francisco is the only place where the grid of the city runs into the ocean. So it was like, let's just go for the, the, all the things, you know, what will it fill every bucket? Can I surf? Can I have a new adventure? And, and can I, you know, get my license and learn how to be a practicing architect? Cause I think people think, oh, it's schools, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to know everything when I leave school. And, uh, I mean, you probably learned this. <laughs> it's like, it's like now I look at people coming out of school and I go, Oh, I loved that naive confidence. And I also, um, didn't know anything when I came out of college. I, I had a, I had a piece of paper that told me I'm something and I had no idea how to put it into practice. And so, uh, I think I knew that I could learn fast in San Francisco. So yeah, I moved out there with filled up my Volkswagen Golf, put the surfboards on top, the bike on top, and just drove out with a buddy of mine and kind of a hope and a dream, and and it worked out. And San Francisco at that time wasn't as you know tech focused as it is now, and wasn't as kind of big money. I don't know. I feel like right now it's just in a moment where it's really expensive to live there and kind of having its heyday. And, uh, when I was there, it was kind of, if you were into something, there was people for you that were also into that thing, you know, whether it's surfing, rock climbing, everyone I ran into, they were like, if you like something, just dive. It's a deep dive into whatever you're interested in. You could find a crew of people that were excited about the same thing. So, and I just thought the outdoor living component, you know, being outdoors all the time. And then, uh, being able to do architecture was kind of a great combination. So it, it worked out. And I, I honestly didn't really lift my head up that whole time. I was working hard and playing hard, you know, going skiing as much as I could, traveling to find waves all over the coast and also living. I literally lived this as close as we are now to the bay is where I lived to the ocean. And at that time, 
I couldn't believe it when I got out there, but no one wanted to live right on the coast because it was so foggy. So I literally could rent a house 200 feet from some of the best surf I had ever seen. And uh, for me, I, I, I was like, I thought I had won the lottery. I just laughed, you know, I was like, oh, this is the best this is the best place you could ever live, you know? And, and at that point in my life, I, I think it is, uh, or it was. And, um, but as I started to spend time there, it was great for my career, great for surfing, but we got married, Carly and I got married and then we had a daughter, my daughter, Luella. And I started to realize that being outside and being connected to the kind of the water and being able to fall right into the water wasn't really an experience she was able to have. It was an experience I got to have because I kind of had put the time in to go surfing, but this wave was huge and it was dangerous and the ocean was kind of heavy. And so it was harder to find those moments for her. And as you, you know, want to go, you know, buy a house or do those things, being close to the water was out of the picture. You know, the housing market there was just so uh, just wild. I mean, expensive and just fast moving. People were buying houses quickly. And so I, I guess I wanted that experience for my daughter. I wanted her to be able to learn to sail and play in the water. And so Maine seemed like the right next adventure. And also there's a transient quality to the Bay Area where you are friends with people and they're they're gone after three or five years. There's just this, not this long-term investment, it feels like in kind of the community. There's some local people there that have kind of stuck it out and are amazing. But I think for those who have kind of come to it, you know, in, in their college years or post-college, I think it's harder to stay. It's harder to keep your foothold there. And so we would have lots of friends or friends of my daughter's who would, you know, be there for a couple of years and then move on. So I think that was kind of a something else that we, I was sad for my daughter and also for me, it was just, you'd, you'd put this time and effort into friends and then they would, they'd disappear. So I think that Maine has a lot of great qualities going for it. And one of them is that people seem to be here for a long time. I feel like my daughter's at this age where she's going to school and she gets, you know, I think the people and her friends around her will be around for a while. And, uh, I also think that, you know, she's already doing sailing and we're playing on boats and it, we're just in the water all the time when, when it's nice and when it's winter, we're skiing. So I think that she gets a lot more outdoor time here and we also get a lot more time as family. So I think that those combinations were what we were hoping Maine would provide, you know, just that connection to water and the outdoors and just more time as a family together and we're pretty thankful that it's worked out that way here. You brought some of your own art with you. Oh, yeah. And um, it's art that you actually, you told me you and Luella spend a fair amount of time painting together and have especially during the pandemic where you would actually have art time. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've been doing watercolors kind of as just the my art, you know, pastime. And uh, so some of these, this one here is, um, we went to Palm Springs a good number of years ago now, but um, my family was having a show where it was my, my, my sisters and mom. So it was the four of us. We were having, well, I, I say show, but it was, you know, my mom said, hey, you know, my, my friend wants us to put some pieces into a, to a restaurant and I signed you guys up for it. So here you go. Everyone's going to put a few pieces of artwork. Are you good with that? And I was like, I hadn't really painted enough. I was kind of like, oh, no. So we had just recently gone to Palm Springs. So I did three pieces. And this is one of them um, in Palm Springs. So this was just uh, one of the photographs that I had taken that I painted. So this is the photo. And, and that's the piece of artwork. So this shows, so there's a sign that says Ace Hotel, and there's a blue truck behind it. And then is that some sort of a well-known, is that Ace, Ace Hotel, the structure that's behind it? Or is that, it looks more like a residence. Yeah, so at the time when we were traveling, Ace Hotel was kind of this new hip 
place to stay where they'd have these smaller rooms, but then kind of more cool accommodations with it. And uh, so we we stayed there. And yeah, it's kind of this like road motel that they converted into something kind of rad. It was a bit hipster. You know, they had kind of taken over this old school 50s um, motel, you know, drive up motel and kind of turned it into something Re- reimagined it and so that was one of the places that we were around a lot and yeah it it's kind of quintessential of the of that moment in time you know and I think I painted this in 2015 so it was um they were kind of at their heyday you know kind of creating these hotels all over the country and uh it just felt like an image that represented Palm Springs in that moment with like dry landscape in the background and um yeah and I, I just love the colors the the blues and the fact that you know the the colors kind of were mirrored between the truck and the and the background so it was just a, a photo that resonated with me from from our travels there and then this was another travel in california that's mendocino and these pieces i started doing these like strips and I would do them at different times um and and mask off the other places that I had painted and I was just playing with the idea that if you create a color five times or three times you might get it more on you know you might represent the color better by painting it five you know mixing it five times instead of once that it you know, none of them were exactly perfect, but all together they kind of represented the the true colors of the the place. So it's just kind of an idea we were playing with. And then this is just a picture that I took and painted of uh, our dock down here. So the the fact that our dock is a working dock with like lobstermen showing up, you know, in winter days and you know doing that hard work of lobstering is kind of. In, Impressive, and the structures they have are cool, and they're moving around. So it just is. Uh, I can understand why Steve does his paintings. You know, it's just the, the, it's very dynamic. Boats. It's like this, you know, house structure that's always turning and catching the light in the right way. And um, these guys pull up, you know, every other day to load on lobster pots from, you know, two hundred feet from the house. So it's fun to take a few pictures and get kind of a sense for it. It's one of my favorite things about Maine is that there's still a working uh, community on the water. Uh, it's it's kind of rare, and you don't realize it until you're not, you know, here you just feel like it's it's everywhere, but it but it's not everywhere. It's 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 pretty special to to this area. So I, I, I think in that way, it, it's fun to paint something that, you know, you you kind of get excited about or, or you want to stay, you know, it's, it's because it is going away in some places because the scale of fishing is kind of growing. It's cool to see that it's sticking around here. Well, Josh, I appreciate your taking the time to come and talk to me today. I mean, if it's, it's been a great conversation and really an interesting, um, the fact that you and I have lived very close to each other for two and a half years, but as often happens, and especially during a pandemic, don't necessarily get a chance to actually have a conversation about life and kind of bigger things. So it's been a really fun conversation. Yeah, it, I uh, feel like um, I know you guys better and it's, it, it, this goes by so quick. I don't know. For me, it's, it's, it's. Yeah, we, we've been here for a while, and, and this seems like the first time where we really get to sit down and have a conversation. So it's, it's fun. Thank you. I've been speaking with Josh Lowe. He happens to be my neighbor on Little John, but also is an architect and an artist in his own right. I really um, I feel very grateful that we finally have somebody back in studio because if one of my pieces of art is these kinds of conversations. And so, of course, it's very collaborative and having done things by video and um, kind of remotely all these months is very fun, but it's a different sort of art. So having an actual human conversation, this makes me feel great. I hope you've enjoyed it. This is Dr. Lisa Belisle for Radio Maine.